Right, so now we're ready to assemble the lower crankcase. We can have a look at the oil pumps, how they fit in there, what they do, what happens to the oil after it leaves the lower crankcase, and also the scavenge filters. So the first component to go back in are the two scavenge pumps. They're just conventional gear pumps, and if we put this shaft in here, that's one pump. This is the other pump, and I'll turn it over. There's this triple gear, which is quite an intricate uh, piece of engineering, because even as a machinist, I know I don't really know exactly how they cut the gears, the teeth that close to that face, because this is made out of one piece of metal. Um, that goes on the top, it's got a taper <coughs> and a spline on it. Typical Rolls-Royce engineering goes into there, and then that drives both the scavenge pumps. And obviously this casing is mounted inside the sump. The extended shaft there, which we'll see later on, will drive the oil pressure pump, which is outside, underneath the sump. I said it's a triple gear there, so you've got, basically, it's driven by the large one from the engine. That small one in there drives the second scavenge pump. The middle one is used to drive hydraulic undercarriage pumps through this opening here, which again is something we'll see later on. Another feature which they changed during production was to increase the capacity of the oil pump. So here's a gear from an earlier engine and <coughs> they changed over to this tooth profile around the time this engine was made in 42, possibly early 1942. So you can see the earlier gear has more teeth but it's also shallower so you can kind of visualise that the capacity of oil in this pump is going to be greater if it's running at the same speed and the way they actually work is possibly not the way that people think they do so if that was the outlet so i'm not sure which is the outlet actually um let's say that's the outlet anyway they actually run away from the outlet so what happens is oil comes in on this side and it gets carried around there and round there and then down there okay so it's kind of a bit counterintuitive they don't necessarily rotate the way you think they do I've applied a very thin layer of well seal onto this face, which is a really good sealant for metal to metal surfaces and of a gasket. You can use it with gaskets as well. Obviously it's very finely machined, as is the face that it goes onto in the bottom there, because the length of the casing has to be just fractionally longer than the length of these gears, otherwise they won't turn, but with as little clearance as possible, they have a certain amount of end float on them as well. I've put a bit of oil into the two bronze bushes in the bottom of there. I'm just going to lubricate the pumps, but we can pour oil into this afterwards, so it's all finished, so it's not really a big either. And then I've got this tilted over on its side because these gears will fall out if I try and put it in vertically. So I'm still going to keep hold of them, though, because of these long studs. <laughs> in. We've got to turn OK. So now we're just going to fit the bolts. The three bolts are passed through this casing through the bottom and have to have soft aluminium washers on the outside to stop oil leaks holding this casing on and the rest of the studs are going to be used to fit this oil pressure pump on the outside. So I'm just going to grab hold of this here. These. Now, I'm cheating a bit here because these were originally castle nuts. You can see one of them there with a split pin. But because this engine isn't going to be running in the air, I'm using nylocks, and these are actually original nylocks that were used on the Merlin, they were just used in other places on it basically. Um, mainly on Packard intercoolers. Um, but they're actually quite tight fitting nylock nuts out so they're really useful. And 
this third one here this is something i come across a lot on rolls rice stuff because i'm not going to keep singing their praises all the time they forget things wrong so you can't get a socket on there they could have put a bit more clearance on there and in fact i worked on a rolls rice welland which is the first production jet engine fitted to the gloucester meteor and it had a whole ring of about 200 of these things on the large compressor casing and the the nut well i think they were bolts actually were recessed into a counter bore and the, the points the six points on the head were actually touching the counter bore so it begs the question how do you do them up but anyway we struggled that was the answer it's the same with this we're going to have to just and you come across that a bit on this engine but in their defense you've got everything's very tight for space you're trying to make the engine as small as you can because of the frontal area of the aircraft and as light as you can so when you get a few things like this we'll have to put up with it really i think if i skimmed the socket down made it very thin it would probably go in there to be honest i've probably done it at some point over the years forgotten so that's those three done up here we have the the pipe which comes out of the two scavenge pumps and ultimately it comes out the side there and it returns to the tank in the aircraft before it gets there it goes through a return filter and before that it goes through the carburetor to actually heat the butterflies in the throttle which we'll see much later on um, this is a a gland coupling so basically we can tighten that up afterwards to get a close fit over the pipe so we don't get leakage in there and this is another place I'm cheating because they have tab locking washers there and there on these two bolts that hold this flange in place and for some weird reason they put one of the tabs on top and the other one round underneath and it's very difficult to get to now the alternative is that you remove these and take this out however the tab locking plate that's on the back of there is also very hard to get at that, that is how you're supposed to take it out but it's actually quite difficult so what I do if it's a ground running engine which is what this is going to be I mean if ever, any of the parts of this engine ever go back in the air then it would all have to be rebuilt so putting thread locker on there and also a spring washer I've also got a spring washer and a plane washer on there just to make doubly sure it doesn't come loose and I'll probably come in for lots of criticism for this but <laughs> oh hum it is what it is isn't it so I'll tighten those down and then we can turn it over and fit the oil pressure pump so now we're going to fit the pressure pump you can see the spindle here passing down from the scavenge pumps above it these are the two gears um, you've got 10 teeth on each one and if you can see there and if you can see it's got um, basically got timing marks on it so they always go back the same way if they had an odd number of teeth it wouldn't be critical because the next a different tooth comes around every rotation but this one they always stay the same so this gear has got a spline inside it which goes on to that spindle there I want to put Engage the other gear there where it lives and put a thin film of well seal around the pump casing because as I mentioned before the tolerances are so tight on the length of these gears that you wouldn't really be able to get away with a, a gasket so easily in there. Um, this is the outlet from the pump which then goes down into this drilling in the sump and then off to the relief valves which we'll see later. Um, this big port here is the inlet to it so pop it on. Now we've got a couple of nuts and washers which hold it on initially and then the rest of the fittings on the pump are in these positions here and they actually use these sleeve nuts 
So it looks like a bolt, but it's got the thread up the inside of it. And they go on like that. And we bolt the rest of the pump on that way. So I mentioned that the third gear on the pump driving gear operates an auxiliary gearbox, which is fitted in here. So there's a bearing housing with this gear in the top, which goes down inside there. And onto that, you either have a cover plate, if you're not going to actually fit anything onto it, or there's a long coupling shaft here. And this is the bevel gearbox, which was fitted to this engine. Um, at the moment, I'm not going to refit it. I'm actually just going to put the cover plate on there. But as you'll see, I haven't cleaned this up or anything yet, but it still turns really nicely, incredibly smooth. You can see the ball race in the front of there. And this gearbox is interesting in one respect that it actually has its own oil. It's sealed um, at both ends and you fill it with oil. Should be a plate on there somewhere actually. Uh, there you go. It basically just says they've gone to all the expense of making a proper brass plate for it. Fill up with oil to the level plug, which is that one there. So that will go on there with a long quill shaft. And then on this particular engine, this is the hydraulic pump which was fitted to it. Now, yeah, I can't turn that though. Um, I don't know. Without looking at a Halifax manual, I don't actually know what this powered because the two main things that it would probably operate would be the undercarriage, which is probably what it was used for, or hydraulics on the gun turrets on the aircraft. And there are quite a few, obviously, gun turrets on a heavy bomber like this. And eventually I'll clean all these things up and refit them. This additional fitting on the side of the pressure pump here feeds high pressure oil round here, down through a clip here, and it actually goes to the fuel pump on the engine. And then once the filter casings have been installed inside the sump, these are the, the caps. So when the engine's on the aircraft, obviously these will be this way up, you unscrew it, you withdraw that and the filter comes out. So the last items to go into the lower crankcase are the scavenge filter casings. That's the rear one. The front one with its pickup pipe goes in there. And there's all this hardware, amazing amounts of really, really finely machined components, which are used. Obviously, th these are uh, clamps which are supporting this pipe from vibration. And then they also support this windage tray that sits on top of it like that. Um, the windage tray is almost exactly what it says it is. The crankshaft assembly rotating just above here generates a very large amount of airflow. And you want the oil which is being collected in the sump to be away from that airflow. You don't want to aerate the oil because the more air there is in the oil when it's been back to the tank and comes back around again, the less efficient the oil is for various reasons, in fact. And also the oil which is being sprayed out of the crank assembly will land on here and then it'll naturally flow around underneath. And a lot of engines have this feature. It's interesting that all the way through the production of the Merlin, they had these holes drilled in the bottom of the sump here. And I um, can't really get around on there, but th these are the bolts which hold all this hardware in place. And it was only really into the late 40s and early 50s when these engines were used in civil airliners that they actually put a boss on the inside of here which was threaded so the bolt would screw into it so you didn't actually have a hole through which is obviously a potential oil leak they don't particularly leak I mean they have sealants and they have an aluminium washer underneath them but it's just something they did later on to try and cure oil leaks the last thing that's going to go in here is going to be the oil pump drive gear on there and then once it's all assembled up, it'll be ready to fit back onto the engine. Right, that's the crankcase finished, ready to have the lower crankcase fitted. You can see the oil supply gallery fitted there. 
main bearing caps are all split pinned and the lateral bolts are split pinned. Sump gasket is in place and there's one other thing on these you have to make sure these two bolts are in position. They've got a snap ring there holding them in place but they have to be fitted from inside the engine and they hold the reduction gear in place. Before we bolt the lower crankcase down, there are these dowels in the four positions which we have to knock in with this tool with a hole in the middle of it. Like that, and that locates it in position and prevents it fretting against the surface of the crankcase. This is the oil pressure relief valve which is fitted to the side of the crankcase. It's called a compound relief valve because of three valves in it and that's usually shortened to CRV. Down here is the outlet from the main oil pressure pump. So there's a pipe connected to that which feeds up here and then into the bottom of the valve body. This first valve was deleted fairly early on in the production of the engine. And in fact, on most Merlins, particularly later ones, the valve body actually looks like that and it's only got the two ports on it. On this one, it's just capped off with this. Uh, the oil pressure comes in from the pump. It would have gone through here to maintain a higher pressure for the variable pitch propeller which is connected to here. The next valve along is your main oil pressure gallery um, and they're a disc valve and you can see actually this is quite pitted. Now this is either going to need lapping or it's actually going to need a new one and the spring has some pitting on it because there's obviously been water sitting in here. Um, if this leaks then obviously you're going to lose some oil pressure. So that's your main oil pressure which goes through into the gallery which we saw inside the crankcase, which is the aluminium tube feeding the main bearings. It also does feed the variable pitch propeller and it's set at 60 PSI nominally. The issue with the valve which is deleted is it was designed to produce more than 60 PSI, which is what comes from the pump. And when the engine's cold, that's all well and good. But really, when it's up to operating temperature, you might only have 60 or 70 PSI anyway. So it's a bit redundant in that respect. It also has a low pressure circuit with a lighter spring on it and again a really mullered disc valve. This has definitely got to be replaced. That goes down in there um, and that feeds this port here to the reduction gears and it also feeds out the back here along to the wheel case and the supercharger and all these items have low pressure at about 4 psi because they're all ball and roller bearings basically. This is another feature which isn't used on this valve body and in fact again it was completely deleted on later versions. Originally this would have had a valve in it with two positions and it basically opened or closed the oil supply to the propeller. When the Merlin was first introduced it used a two blade fixed pitch wooden propeller called a Watts and then they went on to a two position propeller and this lever would have basically given you fine or coarse pitch. Once they went over to fully variable pitch propellers, you just have a constant oil supply coming out of here and this is no longer needed. This port on here is a quarter BSP for the oil pressure gauge and on the back here we've got a port for the oil temperature sender. So here are the oil scavenge filters after cleaning and this is all the deposits that came out so I soaked them in petrol and this is just a rag which I've used as a filter and really there's, there's nothing particularly there. Um, I'll test it with a magnet here. See there's really nothing ferrous on there. I, th I think all this stuff must just be deposits from dried oil because you don't normally find this sort of stuff in the filters and I mean there might be a couple of bits of bronze coloured metal in there. But actually, this is very much magnified and, you know, there's, there's really actually nothing in there. So I'm really happy with that. Right, so that's the upper and lower crankcases fully assembled. Uh, we'll next go on to building the engine up from the two ends and then the cylinder blocks will go on. Um, if you're enjoying these videos, please feel free to subscribe to the channel because that way you'll get updates when the next video comes out.